Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Long uh, or Young, very much. I'm going to set my own timer here because it's important to be able to w- watch my to watch it on my own little thing. I have a tendency to be kind of wordy. Anybody that knows me knows that. My name is Miss Biddy, and I am a recovered alcoholic. My home group is AA on the Rocks in Caldwell, Idaho, USA, Area 18, District 4, to be very, very specific. My home group meets six nights a week. Five of them are face-to-face, and one is online. Um, I can send that information to Young at some point and maybe get the sign-on information for that on Tuesday evenings, probably the middle of the night for you. So we meet at 6 p.m., and uh, I'm in love with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I truly am in love with it and where this reading says that we become students, right? This uh, AA literature says to grasp and develop a manner of living. Thank you so much for asking me to be here today. And if there's anybody new in the room, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it's you know not the bedrock of mental health, I was taught. And so opinions vary widely. And one of the things I love the most is the is our literature. And, you know, the this brilliant line, the brilliant line in the forward to the fourth edition, the most recent edition we have, this brilliant line that says the literature preserves the integrity of the AA message. And so you'll see, you know, you'll see my virtue signaling. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. All of my pa- the pamphlets are all plainly displayed in the background. Um, I have them here where you can see them. This is so important for AA because it says in our literature that we need to preserve in full strength our means of survival. This is about survival, and and what a lovely group you have your your. Uh, that little flyer in the, in the beginning where it said the name of the speaker, but then underlined on your flyer, way of life, a way of life. And so that's what this is. Um, I have had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. You know, that's, that's you know, kind of, I think, a, a real important, I'm going to put it on screen so I can see you guys. That's an important aspect of sponsorship, I think, because our book says I can't transmit what I don't have. And um, it has changed and it has grown and it has morphed exactly the way it's supposed to. Uh, I'm not the same woman that walked in the door. I'm I'm absolutely not the same woman. Uh, so I'm going to reread a little bit of 306, and that's going to take, you know, some other places. Uh, says, I don't think happiness or unhappiness is the point, right? Because isn't that what I did before AA? You know, I was just seeking to be happy. You know, and that's that's kind of cultural. I think that's the human condition, actually, no matter where you're from. And seeking to be happy makes me very self-centered and self-absorbed and self-referential. And and. And that's the trickiest part of all is like what I've discovered is that all of the good things that come, come as a byproduct. And the minute I start looking for the byproduct as the goal, it vanishes like a mirage. So I have to stay focused this direction. Bill Wilson talks about it in the emotional sobriety letter, which is ultimately the point, right? Ultimately, the point is emotional sobriety. I can't attain emotional sobriety, of course, without physical sobriety. But what I failed to recognize for the longest time is that physical sobriety doesn't treat alcoholism. It revealed it, right? I mean, I I drank. The only reason I ever drank liquor is because I was sober. Oh, you know, that's the only reason I would drink it, because I can't really handle this thing called reality. 
I didn't have any idea. In AA, I learned how to learn, and and that was this whole thing about turning the lens around in my inventory, the first inventory I took, the fourth step. The first inventory is really what cracked that and is what changed, you know, the the trajectory of my of my whole life. So this says, how do we meet the problems we face? It doesn't say, how do I eliminate problems? Right? I mean, life is full of trouble. Life is kind of about troubleshooting. And that's where I got the topic, because I was thinking, what do I really want to talk about? What is my point today? And the point would be, what do I do with discomfort? And so I looked in the little uh, index thing and I looked for pain and pain's not in there. It said, look for trouble, right? Well, that doesn't take long, right? So I went through all of them and I sat quietly at my desk as I do with AA literature. I read other literature too. I, I have a ton of it sitting all right here. Ton of it. It says there's many helpful books also, many. All right, but this lens that AA gives me, these 12 steps are very, what does it say? Precise, clear-cut directions. Change the way I see things, and when I changed the way I could see, I changed it. When the way I saw changed, it changed everything else in my life. I listened to a speaker one time, and he says it's the change that changes everything. And I have recovered. I'm a recovered alcoholic. And it's absolutely amazing to me how much flack you'll catch by introducing yourself as one who has recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, right? And there's massive pushback against that where everything in the book tells me this is what happens. And so I loved at the beginning of your meeting you mentioned specifically the promises of step 10 and you know those facts sometimes people call them the fact because that's you know it right the great fact is this and nothing less that we have recovered 132 have recovered and have been given the power to help others and so when i came in though i didn't know any of those things and i didn't know how to learn and 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 I was defensive, really defensive. And somebody said one time, you know, defensiveness is like the earmark of spiritual immaturity. And I didn't have any fear. And so that was one of the key things, one of the key things in my sobriety and in my life was that when I came in, I had no fear. Get this. And I know you'll laugh because anybody that's been around a while, I didn't know why they laughed. But I sat right at a meeting in Oakhurst, California, by the way. I grew up at the southern entrance of Yosemite National Park in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. I would not be surprised if some of the people on this screen right here right now have driven right through my town, having landed at Fresno, used to be Fresno Air Terminal, but it's called Yosemite International Airline, whatever it is now. But you landed there and you drove through Oakhurst, California and visited Yosemite National Park, where I live. I could saddle my horse at the tie rack and ride till I die. You know, that was just the life we had. But I went into this meeting and I sat at the, what my friend Vern called the enchanted Formica tables back when Formica was a thing. Today it's all different kind of Costco plastic, like the white ones, but they were for Micah in the old days. And, and I sat right there and said, I don't have any resentments. I'm not afraid of anything and I don't have any resentments. And I, you guys, I didn't know why the room laughed, but the room erupted in laughter. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm all doe-eyed. I don't have any idea why y'all are laughing, but it didn't take long to really realize because someone finally, you know, told me about defensiveness. And I'm like, I'm not def. Oh my God. And I had that little, you know, we have emojis today. Back in the day, we didn't have emojis. 
but I had that little mind blown moment where I'll be darned. And the only reason I would show up defensive in anything is because I'm afraid. So all of a sudden, and in one fell swoop in that moment, at that time, I knew that there were things going on in me that I had not known about. That's a real scary thing, okay? It occurred to me that everything that I could see isn't all there is. That awareness of something beyond my own awareness came very strong. And for a moment, I stopped being ashamed of being an alcoholic. And I got really scared. And I think that moment is the moment I became teachable. Because really, you know, we have that. It's probably not new, but, you know, everybody says WTF, right? What is going on, right? And we have other ones. It's why why trust folly, <laughs> right? Every, everything, some other things came into view. And so this reading here touches on a whole bunch of other things. It says, how do we meet the problems we face? Well, one of the ways I meet the problems I face is to recognize what the real problem is. And if I don't know what the problem is, any solution that I apply isn't going to treat, isn't going to be the problem. I'm telling you about the symptoms. And you're trying to tell me about what the problem is, as I'm looking at you going, that's not my problem. You don't understand. And almost everything in column two, we have a new woman on the internet land, and her name is Karen. And I'm a Karen. Everything on my list is what they did. And it's true because our book says to put down opposite each name are injuries and i'm very grateful i had a sponsor because my my memory failed me so badly i've large chunks of life to this day that i cannot recall i grew up in alcoholism i grew up in a place where if you didn't check out the current reality was too much and god is so good that he gives us a place to go sometimes when the reality is that unpleasant the problem is i got stuck in that alternate consciousness isn't that what we're seeking anyway alcohol gave me an alternative consciousness that i didn't know i was i was in pursuit of so it says how can we face the problems and in in alcoholics anonymous i learned what the real problem is and that my drinking was symptomatic of that so I am an alcoholic. I did not drink for reasons or for feelings. I drank because it's Tuesday and I'm an alcoholic and that's what we do. And unless I have a complete psychic change, which kind of started here, but I recognize now it's more of a soul sickness. I read some of our AA history and we talk a little bit about having an egoectomy, a soul. I have a soul sickness. Um, I love the Celts and their version of spirituality. And we have these things called anamkaras. I have soul friends because, and I think one of them's here. Many of them are here. All of you, right? I have an anamkara, which just means a soul friend. And so I go into this thing. You almost died, right? You know, that that seems to be where we need to get. You know, I know that I know this and I've perpetuated this myth for a long time. Uh, that nobody gets to AA by accident, you know, and I thought, oh, that just sounds wonderful. You know, well, here, that's not true. People, there are many, many non-alcoholics in AA today. The real, the alcoholic of my type that needs to have a psychic change sufficient to overcome alcoholism 
I'm the real deal. And, and it's amazing how much flack you'll catch for that when you, you know, I'm a real alcoholic and our literature is so clear. Page 21. What about the real alcoholic? You might start out, which I did. And it says men and women, you know, drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And I mistakenly thought that that was drunkenness, but I didn't realize. And I was embarrassed and ashamed to admit it because I had zero self-worth. But I'll say things today that I could never have said when I was new. I never liked being drunk. I absolutely abhorred the sensation of drunkenness. But it was a price I was willing to pay because it it gave me peace somewhere else in my life that I didn't know I was in desperate need of. It says the the sensation is so elusive. That's what it did. You know, I was never a real social drinker. Got into a little bit of trouble in elementary school or not elementary school, high school, about 16. I had a, uh, an episode with a bottle of Everclear and a boyfriend. Uh, became vicious, violent, and vulgar. And not all alcoholics do that, but, you know, that's what I do. And I said, I'll never do that again. I will never do that again. And I was telling you the truth. The way I could see it because I, but I don't know that I'm lying. I don't know I'm lying because I'm in a delusion. So I didn't really get into any trouble with alcohol until I was in about my mid twenties and it didn't take long about my mid twenties. By the time I'm 27, I'm showing up at Alcoholics Anonymous. I did the math a little while ago. I have 35 years of AA experience and I do not have 35 years of sobriety. My sobriety date is 12-23-2009. So all of that experience, while it's valuable, because I do believe that experience of what not to do <laughs> is important because I can I'm properly armed with the facts about myself. I can say, well, you know, let me tell you what happened to me when I did what you're about to do. So what is my real problem? I'm talking to you about the symptoms. And if if all I want to treat is the symptoms with physical sobriety, if physical sobriety doesn't treat alcoholism, you know, if I push away my normal emotions and I embrace this false positivity that I grew up with, I showed up to AA with big laugh lines, right? I'm, I was happy, dang it. I was friggin' happy. The problem was with the kind of happiness that I possessed, I was about 50 miles wide, but I was only about a half inch deep. And it looks good, you know, until you start trying to have relationships with people and things like that, is I couldn't go any deeper. I couldn't show up. I couldn't show up. Always running. So then he says, um, How do we best learn from them? How do we meet the problems we face? One, by identifying the problem. And, you know, the the problem is fear. When it says fear is an evil and corroding thread, you know, from it stem all forms of, you know, from resentment. And even resentment, resentment is a symptom. How does self show up? The number one way self shows up is in resentment. But even that is a, 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 you know, we look for four things, right? Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I'm forever grateful to the gentleman. His name is John. There's three Johns, Peaceful John, Big John. I call him Home Group John. And then there's this other fellow by the name of John D. And he was History John. And I called him up all wrapped around the axle about something God knows what. And I asked him some questions because I wanted an answer. But he never answered my question. He handed me some AA history and he had me look up the Oxford group. He had me look up the, he he asked me, have you ever heard of the four absolutes? No. Have you ever heard of the five C's? No. And he said, I want you to go investigate these things. Some time had gone by, and I actually ended up with an uh, some kind of a uh, 
it wasn't an Apple device. I think it was some Samsung little tablet that I had because we didn't, you know, I, I grew up in the mountains. We didn't have Internet or anything like that. But I was able to look those things up and it completely changed my life when I realized that fear is the one that's driving the boat. Right. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear <clears throat> teach me it, it narrowed my focus. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is fear. Oh, I'm not afraid. Defensiveness. So now it's like this thing is kind of funneling down and I'm recognizing more and more what I actually am. Is all those things. My whole life had been a farce and a cover up. It's in the back of AA comes of age. If you read any of those uh the Tebow papers. Oh, my God. Read all of that. And all of a sudden, my life is just this thing. It's constant. And I remember. I remember kind of waking up. And thinking every problem in my life today at that point was a reaction to problems I perceived that never really came to to pass. Some did. But I'm going to go on a limb here and say about 90 percent of my life was reacting to stuff that never happened. What does the inventory ask for? Hurt, threatened or interfered with. I was so easily threatened. Oh, my gosh. So all of this or, you know, all of this is fear. He says, uh, so so I need to look for what the real problem is. And the problem is going to be fear for me. This is what I uncovered. It says, notice the word fear is bracketed along, you know, boom, 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 boom. You know, I have a three column resentment inventory. The big book is very specific. My resentment inventory has three columns and a crap ton of prayer because I had been victimized. I I told you I grew up in an alcoholic home and I'm going to. I don't know what the statistics are, so I probably shouldn't. But I've heard the statistics of children growing up in alcoholic homes that have endured incest and psychological, emotional, and physical abuse is very, very high. All right, so I approach the whole world from this standpoint. Right. I'm telling you, I'm not defensive. And don't ask me that again. Right. I've got you in my crosshairs. I don't even know I have a weapon. But I was very, very closed off in this beautiful three column resentment inventory. And that beautiful prayer that says, well, maybe. You know, I never gave the spiritual side of life. Look, some of the stuff that happened happened from the very people that were trying to teach me about God. And I'm like, if that's all you got, I don't want anything to do with that. And that I mean, my heart slammed so shut against anybody that was going to teach me that. And I threw the baby out with the bathwater. So AA changed everything for me. The literature The chapter to the agnostic. This is the kind of thinking that needs to be abandoned. I looked at the ugliness of some of the trees and I missed the beauty of the forest. And I came in with such prejudice. Well, what is that? Pre I fear. Prejudice is always about fear. I think I already know. And I don't know. Squat. I learned those phrases. I learned the phrase, I don't know. And it also came to pass that. It's perfectly okay not to know because I had to have an answer for everything. I don't know was not in our vocabulary. So he says, oops, wrong one. I closed my book. I should never do that. How do we best learn from them the problems, right? And transmit what we've learned to others so that they would receive the knowledge. Can't transmit what I don't have. And. And I'd only I'd only ever in my life ever wanted to be helpful. If you grow up in an alcoholic home, you think you're maybe I mean, maybe I shouldn't say you. 
I grew up in Alka. I thought I was so powerful that I could change everybody. And, and, and if I just act right, then everything will be fine. And what I recognized later being, you know, this quote unquote people pleaser, right? Because that's what I am was all self-seeking. I'm looking for safety. And if you're okay, if I'm dependent on you, it's faulty dependencies. It all goes back to Bill's letter that, by the way, he wrote in 1953, and it was only published in 1958 in the grapevine on emotional sobriety. My faulty dependence. And if I'm dependent on you and you go down, then I go down. So I need to protect you. And I I always thought this was some special virtue. You know, I'm like others centered already. And it's like that. That was one of the biggest myths that stepped uncovered for me. I still do a lot of the same stuff that I did before. I really do. I still will do those things. But the motivation for doing them is completely wrong. There's no price tag on it anymore. You don't have to respond a certain way. You don't have to respond at all. I mean, let's face it, if I'm rushing to get the door for some little old lady with her hands all full and I open the door all altruistic. And if I'm pissed off because she doesn't say thank you, I got to look at my motive. What are you doing? You want the credit? Oh, yeek. Right. Yeah. Still there. I like Bill's story on on fear. He says, none but the most vainglorious can claim perfect freedom from fear. It is a goal to which I aim today. I aim for the perfection. It's in step six in the 12 and 12. I abandon my self-determined objective and I aim. You know, it's to be like, you know, because people don't, those absolutes scare people. Well, because nobody can get a bullseye. All right. You know, when I get a bullseye, I had a sponsee ask me a couple of days ago, when does this end? Right. I mean, brand new, brand new. Every day is this practice of a new way of life, which is not easy. This practicing of a new way of life, it says it gradually becomes a working part of the nine. This is not an overnight matter and it's not transactional. It's transformation. And so I got to go where the pain is to transform the pain or I will transmit it. The whole point of this right here. In my view, we of this world are pupils in a great school of life. It is intended that we try to grow and that we try to help our fellow travelers to grow in the kind of love that makes no demands. Oh, well, that changes everything. In short, we try to move toward the image and likeness of God as we understand him. I've got all kinds of literature here. I read a book that said that God is love. And I read a book that says that God is light. And that seems to fit the bill. Because I grow in the image and likeness of my own creator, that which created me. I am created in that image already i don't need to know what it looks like i just need to uncover it i think there's a really great mystic called rumi and he says ours is not to seek for love at all but to remove the barriers that prevent it and so this whole thing changes he says um when pain comes we are expected to learn from it willingly When happiness comes, we accept it as a gift and thank God for it. It's a byproduct. When happiness becomes my goal, I lose the juice because it's all about me. So I have some other literature that I was going to get to. It's all like right here. Probably not going to get to it, but. If I don't get to the bottom of this thing called fear and move through it. I always thought, you know, in the beginning I did. I thought, you know, because I'd heard in meetings that faith is the opposite of fear. You know, it's like, yeah, no. (laughs) Love is the opposite of fear. It's this perfect love. 
And faith for me ends up being the pathway that I take on the pursuit of unconditional love, which is the one that really blots it out. A uh, lot of good, a lot of good literature. When pain comes, we are expected to learn from it willingly. <sighs> what? Dang. You know, it's just this idea, Biddy, 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 grow up, honey. We need you. And this is the place in our, some of the most beautiful literature I've ever read, at least at the time. It was in the keys of the kingdom. I wear my keys around my neck almost every day. Because it says, I won't, I won't open it. I'll probably butcher it. That's all right. Says AA is not a plan for recovery that can be finished and done with. The principles contained, and please don't get lost in those one word things that you find online. That's that's not AA. The principles contained are great enough to keep any man striving for as long as he lives. So the one word that comes up all the time as a principle in Alcoholics Anonymous is the principle of humility. It says, I don't know the page number, it's in step seven on the 12 and 12 says, humility is the foundation principle of all of AA's 12 steps, right? The attainment of greater humility. It's not one and done. There's layers and layers and layers. And it is all going to boil down when the end comes, like my, my, my new friend to AA. When will this end? <sighs> when they throw dirt on you. That's when it ends. When I'm liberated from this physical world I live in and I greet my creator, I'm going to be asked one question. And it's not going to be. But were you happy? Oh, for, well, I was going to say for Christ's sake, and I actually mean that. For the love of God. Can we stop? This is why it's just such a beautiful thing to move people beyond and quit calling the ninth step promises the AA promises because they're not. They are nine or whatever in a vast list. I have 160. I have a little saved file on my Apple device, like 160 promises in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. There is no more aloneness. A complete change takes place in our approach to life where I used to run from responsibility because, look, I didn't see that. I was a hyper-responsible person. As I ran full tilt boogie from anything that made me afraid. And AA, it's kind of like, you know what it was? You know what alcohol did for me? I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for alcohol. It grounded me. You ever watch those cop shows? And they have the thing they call a tax strip. And the person is like, you know, 110 down the freeway and they have this thing called a tax strip and they throw it out in front of the car and it flattens the tires and it spins out and it ends up dead on the side of the road. That's what alcohol did for me. But it wanted me dead. But here's what I know from AA literature. Cling to the idea that in God's hands, that is the greatest asset I have. So what I thought was the worst thing in my life ends up being the best thing in my life. What all of those things in column two about how they hurt me, because they did, because they did. Okay, nobody's ever going to tell you they didn't. But the thing about that is that was a long time ago, and I am now not responsible for what happened in column two as much as I am responsible for my reaction to it and my lack of compassion. I used to think it was forgiveness. I used to think that was the forgiveness prayer, and perhaps, but it's a Again, thinking in terms of byproduct, this prayer, the resentment prayer, the only one we have 
in our 12 steps. I know there's a prayer in the back of the book. That's not in our 12 steps. This step says, God, save me from being angry. How can I be helpful? Um, I used to think it was forgiveness, but forgiveness becomes a byproduct of viewing everything through a lens of radical and unconditional compassion. I have five minutes. A couple of days ago, I heard a story my friend Derek told. Somehow or another, the topic of the Samaritan came up. You know, and Bill says, it's so clear. I mean, we have directions. This is a book of directions. And, and, and the author, who turns out to be God, we think it's Bill. Bill said it wasn't Bill, for God's sake. In fact, I just heard a historian the other day ta- uh, 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 listening it, it, where, where until Bill had that next, the frontier, right? He said he never really understood step 11. And the guy looks at me, goes, what do you mean you didn't understand step 11? You wrote step 11. And Bill said, no, I didn't. I only downloaded it. So he's as clueless as we are. You know, this apostle Bill, right? I laugh like hell when I call him that because it's hilarious. But he told us to look, to play the part of the good Samaritan every day. Well, what if you don't know the story, you might think it's about returning your grocery cart to the buggy corral. Oh, that's good. Pat yourself on the back. You get an A plus. No, it's not. It's absolutely not about returning, you know, this, you know, the Girl Scout, Boy Scout. It's about laying down your life. And I had my husband tell me the story because I didn't understand. I still don't understand. In layman's terms. What that story is trying to get me to do. And it's a story of radical compassion. It's a story of racism. It's a story of oppression. It's a story of radical compassion. The Samaritan had been victimized. The person he helped was the victimizer. So now I understand what this means by laying aside personal ambition. Our literature is clear. It says personal ambition has no place in AA. None. Check your at the door. And just come in and learn how to love without a price tag. That blew me out because I showed up at AA's doorstep. Honestly, a broken, bleeding, lost. I felt like a dirty whore when I came in here. I was behaving. I had behavior that would indicate that that might be true. But it wasn't. And it was in AA that I learned that I can get free of all of that stuff and then take that and go help somebody else. So we're expected to learn from discomfort. So I looked up adversity. I'm going to close with another another reading. Freedom came to me when I recognized that my problems weren't my problems. That my problems were my solutions to problems I didn't even have. And if when I face my problems square on for what it is, it's all opportunity. If step 10 is not a treasure hunt, you're doing it wrong. Step 10 is a treasure hunt. It's not a some list of, of, where, of where I can improve. It's transformational. I look for every ounce of of transformational pain. I transform it or I transmit it. And it says here in page 91, courage and prudence. This is from the letter in January 1962, my birth month, because it's all about me. When fear persisted, we knew it for what it was. And we became able to handle it, right? I still have fear, but it doesn't dominate me. Fear drives me straight into the loving arms of my creator. 
yea, for fear. We begin to see each adversity, here it is, as a God-given opportunity to develop the kind of courage which is born of humility rather than bravado. Unbelievable. So an entire change takes place in my approach to life. I greet adversity with open arms. I invite pain to sit on my lap. What are we going to do today with you? I'm absolutely in love. In love. In it. Like being in a car. And I'm in love with you. Yeah, you're not the creepy stalker, love. But we're in it at the same time together. So come on in, get in the car, give freely of what you find, not what you brought, and join us in the Fellowship of the Spirit with a capital F. Thank you for allowing me to be in your group today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.